more powerful than Superman because it eats kryptonite for breakfast. We're back. It's episode four of World of Stew. Now the last time we talked it was episode three and we were halfway through looking at the MCU, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and we were just drawing to a close on phase one. We had discussed the Avengers Assemble and we were talking about how it was probably the most epic comic book movie that we had ever seen to that point to date. It didn't elicit, it didn't for me anyway, elicit the same lump in throat moments that you got from other comic book movies um, like Christopher Reeve flying for the first time as Superman. Every time you see that, it gets you right here. Just in case you're wondering, I'm pointing to my chest. But anyway, it didn't need those moments because I defy anyone to not laugh out loud when Hulk destroys Loki and walks away spouting the now infamous line, Puny God. Each character got their own time to shine in the Avengers, which allayed many people's fears that too many cooks would spoil the broth, which is a problem I think they may have going forwards, but again, we don't want to jump ahead of ourselves. Uh, they pushed along their own storylines at the same time as well as the plot of the film and the overall reach of the MCU. And it was during the post credit scene of the Avengers Assemble that we got our very first glimpse of Thanos. Thanos? <laughs> Thanos. And every geek in the audience geeked out more than they'd ever geeked out before when he appeared on screen. So that brought us to the end of Phase one and it was going out with a bang one and a half billion dollars at the box office it was now time for phase two to jump into the fray and it began in the exact same way that phase one had with an iron man film and fortunately this iron man film was iron man 3 and whilst yes it was the second consecutive MCU film to make over a billion dollars in the box office. It was also the first film since The Incredible Hulk to create rumblings amongst certain elements of its fan base regarding the quality or lack of quality, I should point out, in the plot. Now, personally, for me, Iron Man 3 is beyond bad. The main villain was probably the weakest to that point, and the way they treated the Mandarin who, I should point out, is THE iconic Iron Man villain, was shoddy, to say the least. Yes, there are those that love the film, and friends of mine will argue till they're blue in the face that I'm overthinking it and overstating my points, and that it's actually a really good film. And they'll even claim that it is best, it is the best of the three Iron Man films. And of course, the fact that it took $1.2 billion at the box office would seem to attest to that point. But I cannot look past its inadequacies and in my opinion each film in the Iron Man trilogy has been progressively worse than the one that came before it. Even if you can look past the terrible villain, the destruction of the Mandarin character and I'm sorry but the hail to the King short that they put out at the end of, uh, at, it wasn't at the end, it was a Blu-ray extra on the second Thor film I believe it was anyway they tried to repair some of the damage and it just did not work if you can look past all of that and you can look past the fact that once again it ended with a huge battle involving multiple robots there is also the small devastatingly bad moment of Pepper Bloody Potts getting superpowers not only getting superpowers but she also saved Iron Man it is a moment that is so dumb it makes the, a the end of Alien vs Predators look great. And the ending of Alien vs Predators is quite frankly one of the stupidest endings to a film I've ever seen. Can somebody please explain to me why a predator would need a human's help to kill an alien? Surely if he's there to hunt the alien and he fails because he needs help then he's going to get killed by his comrades anyway. But I digress, that's for another time. Marvel, off the back of taking nearly $3 billion from its last two films, continued to play it safe with the next two entries in Phase 2, which were Captain America the Winter Soldier, which personally is my third favourite of all the MCU 
movies to date and the second Thor film which was uh, Thor the Dark World which you've already kind of just mentioned with the Hail to the King short. The films took $714 million and $644 million respectively and the world of comic book movies continue to dominate in movie theatres across the globe. To this point I would argue that Marvel and the MCU had for the most part been Earth based with the occasional detour via Asgard and the far reaches of space which obviously refers back to the Avengers Assemble and the big battle with the Shatari and all the rest of it in that film. It was time to shake things up and with the next Marvel film they chose to go back to gambling a little bit and they went with the Guardians of the Galaxy. Now I'm going to make a confession here put my hand up and say that I was not aware of the Guardians of the Galaxy prior to the film's release. Um, I'd never heard of Star Lord, Rocket Raccoon, Groot, Drax the Destroyer or Gamora. Um, but this actually proved to be a blessing in disguise because unlike the other films I had no preconceptions going in and this allowed me to just enjoy it for what it was. And what it was was a great film but not quite the I know it sounds like I'm being really negative about everything, but it wasn't quite the perfect film that others have claimed it to be. The only reason I say this, and the only reason why it is my second favourite MCU film behind the Avengers, is because the entire sort of end sequence is too similar to what had already happened in the Avengers Assemble. We've already made reference to Hulk smash on Loki and Puny God, well, Groot smashing Ronan soldiers, just, it was basically the same scene with different characters. Um, and also the whole closing battle was basically the same fight from the end of Avengers, just with different characters in a different setting. The whole vibe and the way everything was being destroyed and all the rest of it was exactly the same. So that knocked it down a couple of notches for me. And that is why it is only my second favourite film behind the Avengers. It would be first, but the Avengers came first, so that gets credit for that. It continued Marvel's dominance of the movie world by taking another $774 million at the box office. So all of this kind of brings us up to speed and up to date because Phase 2 is coming to a close very soon. Um, and the last two films in Phase 2 are The Avengers' second movie, which is Age of Ultron, out in cinemas as we speak, and Ant-Man, which is due for release in July of this year. Now here is where the problem starts to become slightly more serious. Many people have seen the trailer for Ant-Man, and they are predicting that it could be the first chink in the MCU armour. Now I personally haven't seen the trailer because I have a policy of avoiding trailers as much as I can for films that I want to see. Because for me, trailers nowadays show too much. They show all the main set pieces to the point where sometimes you don't actually have to watch a film to know what's going to happen. I think the prime example of this would be the trailer for I, Frankenstein, which basically told you the entire plot of the film to the extent that you didn't actually have to see the film, which wouldn't have been that bad a deal anyway because the film was quite bad. So I haven't seen the Ant-Man trailer, but those who have seen it are saying that they're not that impressed and they're not necessarily looking forward to it and that it could be the first flop that Marvel have made. Uh, it will still take hundreds of millions of dollars at the box office, of course it will. It's a Marvel film, people are going to flock to see it, but as far as I can remember, it's the first film to come out, and obviously it's not out yet, it's out in a month's time, or a couple of months time, it's the first film that I've actually heard negativity surrounding it prior to its release. There have been bad vibes about other films after they've been released little gripes about this little gripes about that particularly for instance iron man 3 with the terribleness of the mandarin but this is the first film where people are like mm, i'm not convinced i've not seen enough in the trailer that's going to convince me that it's going to be good so it's going to be interesting to see if it is the first 
flop of Marvel. However, and this is something you would probably expect from me, and it will not sit well with a lot of people, particularly friends of mine who rave about Age of Ultron, I would argue that Age of Ultron is actually the first film of the MCU to fall short of expectation. Now, why do I say this? Well, yeah, of course, today it's taken over $800 million at a box office and is on course. It's easily going to break through the $1 billion barrier, let's be honest. But it has not, per, from my perspective, set the box office on fire in the way that many people thought it would. I think a lot of people thought after its opening weekend, it would go on and it would already have broken a billion and it would go on to be one of the I know, top three or four grossing movies of all time, surpassing the original Avengers takings at the box office, which I don't think it's going to do. It has the second highest opening weekend in American cinema history, uh, behind only the first Avengers film, in that it took something like $191 million, I think, in its first weekend. However... It has also had the second biggest drop off in earnings between its first and second weekends in American cinema history when the second weekend's take-ins were down by 60%, which equates to $114 million. On top of all this, it is actually also behind Furious 7, which is obviously the seventh film in the Fast and the Furious franchise. That, to date, has taken $1.5 billion dollars. Yes, there is an argument that a lot of that is due to the death of Paul Walker and the fact that people wanted to see it. But there is obviously an audience out there for the Fast and Furious films. And if that ends up taking more money than the Avengers Age of Ultron, I think you would have to consider Age of Ultron to be kind of the first flop of the MCU. It's also garnered... Uh, you know box office figures aside has also garnered somewhat negative reviews from some quarters yes as i've already pointed out there are those people who would say that it is great and they love it and it's an absolutely awesome film but there are also many who myself included who see it as flawed and consider it a disappointment based on what they were expecting from for me it starts off with ropey cgi it then goes on to the the whole vibe of the film. It's just kind of it's been there and done that. We've seen so much of the film before. Yes, there are little nice little touches to it. I will agree. I will admit that I marked out when and there there is spoilers in this part of the podcast. So if you haven't seen Age of Ultron yet, then please by all means stop listening now and come back and listen when you've seen it. Um, there are moments in it that I did mark out at when Vision hands Thor his hammer, proving that he is worthy of wielding Molyneux. I think that's how you pronounce it. Again, excuse my country accent. Also, when Captain America almost picks up the hammer when they're all having a few drinks and all the rest of it. And the Hulk versus Iron Man in his Hulkbuster suit is amazing. But... Again, it just feels like we've seen it all before. The closing battle, again, features an army of robots. Originality is apparently not the strong suit of the MCU. It's the Avengers with their two newest members, Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch. Another quick spoiler here, Quicksilver dies in this film. In fact, during this entire film, Quicksilver comes across as pretty irrelevant it's almost like he's there solely to serve the purpose of dying to save Hawkeye at the end of the film and that's the only reason he's there and he does nothing of note for the rest of the film leading up to the point where he dies speaking of the Quicksilver character it's not the first time of course that we've seen Quicksilver in the movies because Fox put him in X-Men Days of Future Past which is my favourite comic book movie of all time and the Quicksilver in that film is far superior to the one that we get in Age of Ultron. 
uh, the reason why there's two different characters in two different films, it all goes back to the right issues again, where Fox can call them mutants because that's what they are, but Marvel can't. It's a long-winded, very complicated story. If you want to read more about it, then by all means Google Marvel Cinematic Universe or Marvel Film Rights and you will see more about that. If you move aside from the fact that the final battle is again an army of robots, it also has the plot of the ending with the big bad, the supervillain that is Ultron, his scheme for ultimate victory and to destroy the planet and stop the Avengers from existing and kill the Avengers is one of the dumbest supervillain ideas in the history of supervillain ideas. He tries to get some nuclear bombs, but he can't because he's being locked out by Jarvis. Again, more spoilers, please. I will post a note on this saying that it's full of spoilers. But if you haven't seen Age of Ultron, do not listen to this until after you've seen it. When he can't get a nuclear bomb, despite the fact he's supposedly the cleverest artificial intelligence being ever created, his super plan is to lift up a town, lift it up off the ground with a load of rockets, take it up into the atmosphere and then just drop it as if it's a giant meteorite, uh, which will then wipe out most of the world's population. That sounds dumb and it was dumb. In fact, it is so dumb that it has to be seen to be believed. So moving forward, out of Age of Ultron, which personally I wasn't that enamoured with, we ask ourselves, where does the MCU go from here? Well, we're entering Phase 3, obviously via Ant-Man in July, and the question is, when will the superhero bubble burst? I'm not trying to be a negative Nancy about it, I am a comic book geek, I love superhero films, but there must come a point when people will tire of them. There are 10 more Marvel Cinematic Universe movies to come between now and the end of 2019. So that's another four years, ten movies, that's more than two a year, two and a half a year on average. On top of that, we have countless DC movies that are about to be released as they launch their own cinematic universe, trying to play catch up with the Marvel Cinematic Universe because DC have never really tried it but they've seen the success of marvel and they've decided we want some of that pie so they launched theirs with man of steel which we won't go into now but it was frankly the worst superman film of all time and it's leading into what is going to be a real mess of a movie with batman versus superman which i'm genuinely not looking forward to and i have watched the trailer for because i don't care about spoiling it and it's bad Ben Affleck is not Batman, but we've covered this. Um, we don't need to go over old ground. So we're going to have lots of DC movies, 10 MCU movies. And on top of that, there are going to be more X-Men films. We've got X-Men Apocalypse coming out in 2016, which is going to be the final movie of the Brian Singer X-Men franchise. And they are then talking about rebooting the whole thing again. Because clearly that's what we need right now is another reboot. We are also going to get a Fantastic Four film later in 2015. A Deadpool film in 2016 which I'm personally really looking forward to. As long as they give it the R rating that they're planning to. Because that could be all kinds of awesome. Uh, there will also be another Wolverine film. And there's bound to be other superheroes coming along to ride the coattails of success the MCU has brought to this point. When will we reach the point of saturation? When will people get bored of superhero films? Maybe they're starting to get a little bit bored now, particularly if the quality continues to drop off like I think it has in Age of Ultron. If Ant-Man doesn't prove to be a success, then they are really going to need to knock it out of the park with their next film, which... I escapes me now, but I believe it may be Black Panther or Doctor Strange, or it may even be it may even be Captain America Civil War, which again I'm really not looking forward to, but that's with my comic book head on because 
I do not see how they can do the whole Civil War storyline justice in one film. Yes, they laid the groundwork for it in Age of Ultron, which is another complaint that I have about uh, the Age of Ultron, is that it doesn't really feel like it's a film that focuses on being a film. It's a film that focuses on being a advertisement for what is to come. During the film, we have some conflict between Iron Man and Captain America, which is obviously leading to Civil War. We also see Thor at the end of uh, Age of Ultron, more spoilers, fly off up to Asgard because he's had a vision of some terrible thing that's going to happen up there, which is obviously the plot for the next Thor film, which is coming out. It's also going to be a third Thor film. Are there too many comic book films coming out? Personally, I think maybe there are, but until we get to that saturation point, we should revel in the geekdom of it all and enjoy the feast of comic book movies that we are going to get served up. All that aside, and I, I hate to go back to it, Batman vs Superman will suck. It will be maybe not quite Batman forever bad, but it will certainly be X-Men The Last Stand bad. Let's put it that way. Will I be proven wrong? Hopefully I will be. We will wait and see. So there we are. That is the second half of this podcast a regarding the Marvel Cinematic Universe, all the comings and goings and the movies that we've had so far and the movies that we're going to get. If you've got any comments at all, you agree or disagree, then feel free to hit me up on the comments boxes below. You, this podcast will appear on Podomatic. It will also, I'll also copy it in on Facebook. You can check me out on my Facebook page, World of Stew. And new to the World of Stew, you can also now check me out on my very own website. It's silentmovieman.wix, which is W-I-X dot com forward slash World of Stew. If you check that out, you'll see on there, um, it's got a record, it's got a note of all the books that I've written to date that you can purchase on Amazon.co.uk. It's also got every episode of World of Stew that I've done to date, and it has a blog which I will try to keep up to date as much as possible. Also, remember you can check out my good buddies Pavo and Neil at Pancast.co.uk for the multitude of podcasts that they knock out every now and again every single one of them is a hit and a winner you'll find me on some of those shows and that is that i will be back with episode five i've got a few ideas if you've got any ideas that you'd like me to discuss or dissect again by all means leave a comment in any of the relevant places i'll see you next time take it easy